Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. It's just fantastic to see everyone. Mary Claire Maroney, and I'm chair of the English department here at John Carroll. And on behalf of all of my department colleagues, I am so pleased to welcome you to this very special event honoring Dr. David LaGuardia, who will retire at the end of this semester after 53 years of inspirational teaching, leadership, and service to the university. Thank you to all President Johnson, to the academic leadership team, to our faculty, our students, our alumni, friends, and neighbors for joining us this evening. A very special thanks to the alumni office and to the marketing department for making it possible for us all to connect in this way to celebrate David. Dr. Philip Metris, professor of English and director of the program in Peace, Justice and Human Rights will now introduce David and facilitate the rest of this evening's program. So I turn it over to you, Phil. Thanks, Mary Claire. It's so great to see so many faces right now um, to celebrate David LaGuardia's um, long tenure at John Carroll University, 53 wonderful years. Um, I happen to be in my car, so if it looks a little sketchy, I'm just, um, I'm fleeing the police presently, no worries. Um, but I, I had, I had to, to, to do this um, and, to, and to join you tonight because of my, my deep, my deep respect and gratitude and, and, and um, just absolute joy in being um, the neighbor to David in the last few years uh, next to his office. And so, as you probably already know, uh, Dr. Dave LaGuardia has been teaching or um, at John Carroll for 53 years. He has held many offices, not only professor of English, of course, but also the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, as well as uh, the provost of um, the academic vice president of the university. Um, when I came in 2001, he was, he was in the provost's office and I got a chance to to, um, to talk with him a bit. And one of the things that struck me right away was that David was so centered in Ignatian values and in the Jesuit education process. Um, and I see that every day, um, you know, notwithstanding COVID, every day when I would go into the office and see students come in to talk about their papers, they would come in to talk about their papers but oftentimes a half an hour, 45 minutes, or an hour would pass as not only the subject of their papers would be discussed, um, whether it was about Hemingway or Faulkner or Toni Morrison or Wallace Stevens, but also the text of their lives would be discussed. And you know, as the child of two therapists, I have to say that David, if, if you need another career, I believe that therapy is in your, is in your future because there's this way in which the work that you've done, not only um, regarding our profession in English, but the work that you've done to mentor so many students uh, is, is as important as anything you've taught them about thesis statements and making good arguments, as far as I can see. Um, and I know that the fact that there are 300 people on this call is a testament to the fact that you've always led um, your Professor, professorial life as a vocation and not as a job. You, David, as you probably also know, published a book, Advance on Chaos, um, about the work of Wallace Stevens. And I, I'm, I will hesitate from quoting Stevens at, at present, but just to say that, um, that the work of the imagination, which is David's work, is, is the work that Stevens thought was basically the work of making a life, the supreme fiction of making a life. And I just feel so grateful that I've been able to witness David's work from afar, from next door. So please welcome for this last lecture, David. Now we've got to unmute David. Alec, Alec, can you unmute David if he's not unmuted? I think I'm unmuted. Can, can you hear me? Okay, good. 
Well, this is a little bit overwhelming. Um, I, I, I wasn't quite expecting this. So, so you, all of these wonderful names and faces from the past um, is not something that I, I anticipated to be quite so dramatic and have such an impact. I, I wish we could just open it up and have a, have a kind of pajama party discussion uh, rather, than, rather than me read at you, which is what I'm afraid I'm going to do. Um, but, but thank you ever so much, all of you who have been able to, 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 to plug into this and to enter this, this, what we, I guess we have to call a COVID classroom. Um, it, it's, it's what we have and, and that's, and that's better than, better than nothing. So, um, so please sit back and relax and forgive me in advance for, for reading at you. I've just put together various thoughts um, and, and you'll hear them now. Uh, when Filmetris first broached to me several weeks ago, the idea of participating in this lecture, I didn't fully appreciate what he had in mind. I confess to dragging my feet uh, before responding to him since even one's final semester turns out to be busy, 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 as with all of the others. And I, I didn't know how or where I, I might fit in the time for the specialness of such a lecture. Uh, besides, you know, one prefers a quiet fade out. And that's uh, what I was hoping to have. Uh, and I think most professors I know prefer that also. And who among us lectures anyway? Uh, the, the, the concept of a lecture is, is uh, uh, in a strict sense, is, is something that many of us don't, don't, don't do. But anyway, based on what I had heard, the idea was to initiate a departmental tradition, localized, small, in which a retiring prof uh, could address a few English majors, a few recent alums, perhaps, a few family members. That sounded safe enough to me. It's not easy to say no to Phil Metris anyway. Uh, and so I agreed. Phil innocently complicated my decision by attaching to his proposal note a link to Professor Randy Pausch's touching and now world famous last lecture, which he delivered at Carnegie Mellon University a few months before he died of pancreatic cancer. I watched it, I admired it, and frankly, I shivered. Um, I, I, I could not measure up to that even if I had loads of time to prepare. And then over a brief span, other gut checking incidents began to occur. A request for cameo shots uh, a good-natured challenge from, from Dr. Debbie Rosenthal that I was hiding the lecture from my current students. Uh, an inside JCU promotional um, announcement to the Zoom link to all of the staff and all of the campus. And then a general invite to alumni in, and then another general invite to full and part-time faculty. Who could have guessed that a bunch of English professors led in this venture by a poet, no less, could earn an A plus in marketing skills. Uh, so much for a tiny departmental event. My nephew John in Arizona somehow heard about it. Uh, my wife Lisa urged me to forward the link to family, hers and mine to my son Michael's family in Half Moon Bay, to my daughter Lisa's family in Bellingham, Washington, to my sister Mary and her family in Pittsburgh, to my sister Barb and her family in Tuckerton, New Jersey, to wonderful in-laws in Pittsburgh and Cleveland and Buffalo. The spider web kept spreading uh, to nieces and to nephews and to friends. And then sarcastic advice from loved ones started coming in. Uh, I should read from a telephone book. Uh, I should read a chapter from Moby Dick. I should pat my head and rub my stomach for 40 minutes. Uh, I should accept the challenge to insert the word 
kerfuffle somewhere into the talk, which of course I would never do. Uh, my 14 year old granddaughter, Lily, even volunteered to write the entire talk for me. And she did, and here it is. Drink your milk, stay in school, that's it. Uh, then she said I should perform a dramatic mic drop uh, and, and it's tempting, uh, but, but I won't. By now I have tempered my anxieties as to what this talk should be. It, 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 it won't be heavy, it won't be scholarly. Uh, I realize that I have simply been invited by people who care to present a retrospective of a long career at John Carroll University. Uh, clearly I have remained in this profession longer than most do, but not all. Some have, have remained much longer than I. Uh, it would have been easy and even logical to have retired in 2008 when I stepped down from administration. But then I would have missed the, the wonderful students I have come to know between then and now. I preferred to finish in the classroom, that magical space in which I originally chose to be, the purpose of it all uh, for me. If this last lecture begins a new tradition, that would be great, especially now that my part in it will be finished. Um, in the minutia of our daily lives, we spend too little time, a lot of time looking forward writing eloquent proposals for vague tomorrows. Uh, it cannot hurt though to reestablish perspective by occasionally looking back as I invite you to do with me for a few moments this evening. All joking aside, I am humbled by the support and grateful for the kindness of Phil and all of my colleagues in the English department for whatever they have had to do in order to organize and then participate in this event. I am a fortunate person and I know it <laughs> to have spent my final years as a professor in a first rate department with excellent people. I wish specifically to acknowledge the department chairs who have gently prodded and led since I returned to the department from administration in 2008. First, uh, Professor Chris Roark, whose presence is keenly felt despite his premature death at the age of 51, eight years ago. And then professors John McBratney and Debbie Rosenthal and now Mary Claire Maroney, uh, taking on the responsibilities of leading an academic department is no small decision. It changes for several years how one lives one's academic life and one's personal life. Also, though she would not appreciate the attention I extend huge appreciation to our recently retired executive assistant, Anna Hosevar. Unassuming, ever professional, she helped me and others for years to color inside the lines and managed not to become upset at our insistent forgetfulness about deadlines and our lapses in performing basic routines and our sometimes ornery single-mindedness. Finally, I owe to so many people beyond the department so much, the Jim Kukonises and the Barbara Lovequists, the Sally Wertheims and Fred Travises and Howard Grays, the Frank Navratils and Nick Baumgartners, the Ed Glynns and Kathy DeFrancos and Dortha Podlaskis, the Miles Coburns and Jerry Marinos uh, and Bob Colasars and bushel baskets more of folks, many no longer with us, who have contributed to my personal growth and well being and comfort over many, many decades. Normally, if you happen to remember normal, we would be meeting now in a small auditorium in the comfort of kind eyes and friendly faces. Zooming may be less kind and more impersonal, yet it shrinks distances, doesn't it? and makes it easier, especially during snowstorms, to fight the traffic. Uh, I, I, I welcome warmly all who have put aside time to listen to these brief comments and, 
and and I am so amazed that 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 people have come from so so far away in 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 time and years as well as as space. I'm I'm really grateful for your presence. A few rooms away, my wife Lisa, my in-person audience of one, watches on a separate screen in order to avoid the possibility of sound distortion. With patience and tolerance and love, she has for years weathered the zany, complicated days of being partner to a university professor. That is not an easy task. This retirement is for her. Let us now begin this retrospective. In 1976, the editors of the university yearbook, the Carillon, since they knew that I had had also been like them an undergraduate student at John Carroll from 1961 to 1965, invited me to submit an essay of reminiscence that detailed what the campus was like in 1961, a time for them that was way back when, but for me it was a mere 15 years ago. So there on pages 14 and 15 of that old yearbook, is that essay squatting beside a full page picture, a barely recognizable 70s version of myself, long dark hair, nerdy specks, white turtleneck, and some sort of curious seashell dangling from a chain around my neck. What was then only 15 years ago approaches almost 60 years ago today. Those junior editors who were 20 years old in 1976 are now 64 or 65 contemplating retirement. And there is a good chance I have taught some of their children, hopefully not some of their grandchildren, though that's possible too. We of course know that this time work is, warp is part of the process of our lives. And yet it takes a deliberate pause like this one, for me, something called retirement something called a last lecture to bring it all into focus. As the theme of that old yearbook essay tit uh, uh, titled A Touch of Nostalgia, I stole a well-known passage from a Walt Whitman poem out of the cradle endlessly rocking that says this, from such as they now start the scene revisiting, I, chanter of pains and joys, uniter of here and hereafter, taking all hints to use them, but swiftly leaping beyond them, a reminiscence sing. I sing a reminiscence. Whitman was referring to the collision in memory of imagery and incidents that combine to create a pivotal insight in our present life. Minus his gusto, here am I, singing that 1976 reminiscence again, yet from an entirely fresh vantage point. Although we usually feel we cannot afford the luxury of indulging in nostalgia, we all do it, don't we? Even when the past we recall may be only a year or so ago. That said, I invite you to join your rich memories and, and uh, certainly many of, uh, we have shared many of them together. Uh, whether from JCU or any university, to some of my own, for what we recall, what we recall individually does not much differ in emotion and in value from what others experience, no matter how specialized our memories might be. Nostalgia, of course, can be a difficult road, especially for sentimental idiots like myself. A recent New Yorker spoof titled Vaccines I'm Working On, referred to a blubbering vaccine, which the article mocked, was designed as a cure for aging men whose immune systems are less able to resist sentimentality, and so they cry more like babies. The spoof goes on to report that 10 older men were given this vaccine and were then asked to watch that awful scene in Old Yeller, in which Old Yeller dies. None of them cried, and only one old and one old man even laughed. So, our goal during the next few minutes, while we wait that vaccine, like the other vaccine, to come to us, is to have as little bubbering as possible as we travel down these roads. Presently, 
the university, like many others, experiences challenges as severe as any in its history. It will survive, but it will change. Many worry legitimately over whether the institution's identity and traditions will remain intact. As a relief valve to, to such worries, since I, 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 I can't address those, um, as a relief valve, in order to place that likelihood of radical change into context, consider this portrait from my yearbook reminiscence of an all-male seminary-like place, a John Carroll University from 1961 to 1965, a shadowed ghost of who we now are, a place that even I who lived in it can barely recognize today. Here is the passage. What girls there were, were remnants of evening school classes, dangerous intrusions to our celibate chauvinist minds, eaves in our Carol's Eden. We were Carol men, ring to girls back home, nurtured for academia, suit coated and tied to cafeteria dinners, required weekday mass once a month, confession in chapel 24 hours a day. In Dolan and Pacelli halls, a gendarme Jesuit made the rounds each midnight for a lights out check. Desperate freshmen and sophomores devised heavy blanket camouflages to cover dormitory windows, or worse, crammed for exams under bed covers with high intensity lamps for companions. We were pre-Vatican, pre-assassination, pre-Vietnam fever and Kent State slaughter. John Kennedy's shock of, of uh, hair and Camelot virility were tempting us out of crew cuts, Princeton's even leftover ducktails. The Beatles were not yet deified and Beatnik, hybrid of Sputnik in the lingo of space freaks was the nation's bad word. We were too young for Korea, too old for the mass draft of Vietnam, too ambivalent in our self identities to worry much about either. And the good Jesuits proffered their paternal arms in our parents' stead in loco parentis. Carol was a cocoon and we were delighted in our dormancy. Each Friday, armed with muskets in ROTC military attire, we hudded across the athletic field, bleating ribald cadence songs, playing soldier before lunch. The daring among us dropped in the night from dormitory windows or sped about the quadrangle at 2 a.m. in old VWs as if we had found something new, but there is nothing new. John F. Kennedy's brains splattered our innocence in 1963 and his horse-drawn caisson dragged the hearse of our youth to his grave. We learned disillusion, lowered our optimism to half-mast. If we managed to smile into graduation, it was an uneasy, suspicious grin in our, on our commencement faces. America began to become what it was to become, ruddied butterflies. We fled the cocoon, unquote. Hearing this old reminiscence from a man once again reminiscing, <laughs> can we doubt that change might be good even as we sometimes fear it? It is difficult to imagine that 28 other Jesuit institutions were much like the one described in this passage. And even more difficult to imagine that students on our campus had to sneak, break rules, risk punishment in order to find a hiding place just to read tomorrow's assignments for classes. Mostly what this example proves, of course, is, is, is that I am old, old, old. Yet I remember vividly, as most people living then do, the afternoon of November 22nd, 1963. I was a junior. Kennedy's death was announced minutes before my three o'clock class in American literature, the very course I have now taught for decades. Sitting in a basement room of the ad building, 30 shaken sophomores and juniors knew not what to expect. How could an American president be shot to death only minutes before? The professor entered the room, meticulously placed his notes and books on the desk, 
sat down and bowed his head on his arms while he remained perfectly still for at least two seconds, uh, two moments. Then he raised his head, looked at us in silence for a few seconds, and without a single allusion to the event, taught the class. I remember thinking, how could he do that? I have come to realize now how graceful and elegant an act it was. Silence is its own loud language. Like it or not, intense instances like this one become part of our personal, even our academic DNA. We are subtly shaped by them. Later that same evening, a large group of students, perhaps searching for an emotional and physical center, assembled apparently spontaneously at the base of the flagpole in the middle of the quadrangle, then appropriate to the time and to the context, as a group, they prayed. In recalling this event, I realized an odd connection, the connection of space perhaps, to other national tragedies of which I learned standing on practically that exact same spot. 23 years later, now a professor on January 28th, 1986, I stood in the basement hallway with students and faculty less than 15 feet from that classroom where I had sat as a junior. And we watched in silent shock as the Challenger space shuttle exploded shortly after takeoff, killing all aboard against a, the backdrop of a, of, a, of a crystal blue sky. We lingered, we watched 10 replays and then dispersed in silence. No one spoke. And 15 years after that, in an office situated immediately above that same classroom, I was called on September 11th to the hallway TV in time to watch the towers fall, one after another in downtown Manhattan. The mayor of Cleveland published an alert to the major institutions in the area that one renegade plane had just circled over the city, heading, we soon learned, to massive destruction in a field outside of Pittsburgh. The next afternoon, several hundred students of a completely different generation, searching again a center of emotional gravity and apparently spontaneously again, surrounded that same flagpole on that same flag, uh, the same quad, needing to commune close to one another in contemplative silence. Looking back now, over 52 years later, it's a little hard to imagine who that person was who began his career as an instructor in September of 1968. After a year of teaching at a small college elsewhere, he had been invited back to John Carroll, receiving a letter out of the blue from the department chair to the place where he had been nurtured through two degrees already. He hadn't even begun to pursue his third degree yet. Such an invitation could never, never happen today uh, and should never happen. Yet it's how I got here and don't know where I, would, I might be if it had not occurred this way. I was entering a department as a colleague to the very people who had been my professors. Self-consciousness, unease were my typical emotions for the while, especially so since many of those fine professors, and they were fine, were of the opinion that significant literature stopped in 1798 uh, when the British romantics led literature astray. And that studying American literature of all things which happened to be my field, was pretty much a waste of time. So here came this upstart nosing his way into hallowed ground. The entire faculty was male, mostly Jesuit. Faculty offices for many departments consisted of clustered open cubicles, two to three profs in each, small desks, little space for books unless you carried in your own boards and bricks and found a place to put them. Students sat practically in each other's laps as they conferred with their particular profs. This may sound like Abe Lincoln pounding the books by lantern light on a log in the woods, but it was our normal. And as with Lincoln, education was occurring. Standards were, were rigid. Collegial interaction was high because it was inevitable. You couldn't help but be collegial. Uh, there was no place to hide. 
Among my colleagues were names, some of which now appear on award plaques hanging in our department hallway. Joseph Cotter, a phenomenal, inimitable teacher who never quite finished his Harvard dissertation and who with deep knowledge and exquisite wit daily demonstrated that it did not matter necessarily. Richard Clancy, Wordsworth scholar, whose generosity to students and colleagues became legendary. Jim Magner, absent-minded poet, who of all things taught me health when I was a freshman in high school in Pittsburgh and became a lifelong friend and who during his years leading the poetry speakers program, which George and Phil have brought forward uh, and which he instituted, uh, Jim Magner, uh, brought to the campus such familiar names from the deep past as W.H. Auden, John Updike, Allen Ginsberg, James Dickey, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Nikki Giovanni, Anne Sexton, Richard Wilbur, and many others. And then there was Tom Hayes, at the time young like me, who became a beloved professor in his own right until his retirement a few years back. He and I still share memories, trying to search out and clarify the good old days. Even within this reduced and primitive format, John Carroll's reputation back then, much like today, was yet so different from today, was strong. The university was in a growth mode. Necessary progress seethed just beneath the surface. That young punk of a LaGuardia hardly knew what he was in for, and he would surely have changed some things if he did know. The 60s, as the decade is now called and studied, had tilted America on its axis. Students entering this university and all universities in 1968 were coming from a summer of two more numbing assassinations, Martin Luther King's on April 4th, Robert Kennedy's two months later on June 6th. The war in Vietnam had reached a feverish pitch of strategic and political controversy. Responding to the morning and evening TV news, the world ate breakfast and dinner watching chaos within Vietnam villages and jungles, assaulted by the litany of daily body counts. Violent death was everywhere. The draft was still in place. And these students not only could be drafted, but some of them knew friends, uncles, even parents who had died in the war. Universities were no longer cocoons of isolation and protection. One, once docile youth were now on fire with life death causes. The more conservative faculty, and they often were much more conservative, especially those who had taught here for decades, had trouble adjusting to the pace and shocks of change in their students. Traditional classroom decorum began to evaporate. Class dress codes shifted seemingly overnight from khakis and blazers, skirts and, and blouses to leathers, boots, headbands, tie-dyed shirts, uh, and per which will perhaps help you better understand that curious shell necklace in my yearbook picture. Nixon's election in 68 intensified confrontation nationally between doves and hawks in reaction to the war. Marches and protests escalated into riots on campuses and in cities throughout the country. Case students sat in and blocked traffic in both directions on Euclid Avenue on one weekend. Carroll students did the same at Fairmont Circle. Amid and yet part of the tumult in 1968, John Carroll University finally admitted women to all full-time programs. The seminary was shutting its doors. In a stunt night skit in the early 60s, Carroll students portrayed their institution hilariously as apathy you, but there was no space for apathy now, even in, at this conservative based Catholic place nestled on the periphery of the Carroll urban, of the Cleveland urban community. Students were angry and they demanded answers to their question and actions to their demands. Among their competent leaders was one Tim Rossert of NBC fame and now part of our nomenclature of whom I, I retain a fond memory of him sitting with tumbled hair in my home 
bouncing my two-year-old son, Michael, on his knee. He and Ed Ignatios and several others displaying extraordinary maturity and leadership at so young an age, managed to keep a lid on more serious, potentially more violent campus eruptions. Mostly students demanded relevance, a concept of shifting nuance, easy to understand, but impossible to define. An example, I remember the girl who rose confidently from her seat in the middle of a 19th century American lit discussion and screamed at the top of her voice, can you please tell me what any of this shit has to do with what's going on in the real world? One tried without much success in the immediacy of her frustration to suggest that understanding Bartleby the Scrivener and Pearl Prynne somehow helped us to better understand the mess we were in, that perhaps Vietnam was our white whale. Unconvinced, that student marched boldly out of the classroom into her relevant afternoon. Nor can I forget a day I sat in the president's conference room as the youngest and most suspicious member of a committee chaired by Father William Malore, after whom one of our dormitories is named, and, con and, and convened to discuss parietal hours, uh, the right of students of the opposite sex to enter each other's dormitory rooms, an enormous topic back then since visitation to dormitory rooms by members of the opposite sex was permitted from 2 to 4 p.m. on Sunday afternoons with the door ajar. And suddenly 200 students surrounded the doors to that president's conference room, singing, shouting, belching, displaying their favorite fingers through shaded windows, demanding that this decision had best go their way. They wanted to bring an end to this primary symbol of in loco parentis. I may recall this so well because I was the single committee member to vote in favor of that change. A courageous president named Father Henry Birkenhauer had the foresight later to reverse the committee's negative decision and thus to drag the college kicking and screaming into the modern era. We all know how the curtain fell on, the, on these most difficult years. On May 4th, 1970, Governor James Rhodes sent the National Guard to confront protesting students on the campus of Kent State, less than 30 miles away from us. The soldiers fired live bullets indiscriminately into an unarmed crowd and four students were killed. Their bleeding images appeared on front pages of newspapers around the world. And then the cities across the nation burned. Kent immediately shut down, changed from that hour. And several of their displaced students bivouacked briefly on our campus on their way home. Instability was everywhere. During a night shortly after the shootings, a bucket of pig's blood was tossed against the walls of the JCU ROTC building, which has since been torn down. Fearing for the safety of students or that the university might lose one or more of its buildings through riot or fire, President Joseph Schell canceled all classes immediately, proclaimed students must receive the grades they had earned up to that moment and sent everyone home for the summer. I have on a shelf in my office, which I haven't seen in a long, long time, <clears throat> tied together with a piece of old white string, the stack of green grade books that include the names of every student in every class I've taught from start to finish. Opening any one of those books to any single page is like releasing butterflies into the air, fun to look at, difficult to catch. Memory is fickle, but it's what we have. As you can tell from all the specific detail already in this talk, when I look backward, and especially when I consider what it has meant to have had the career I've had, knowing I won't teach again, memories both good and bad come sweeping in. Here are a few more of them. 
I cannot forget the brilliant young woman in the 80s who took my section of what we then called the first year seminar. She left John Carroll after only one year, as students sometimes do, because she fell in love with and married a dentist and had several children and was living a happy life. She remembered our class and used to send an occasional note to tell me how she was doing, mentioning once that she saw I had published a book on Wallace Stevens, that she had purchased it and was reading it, which amazed me because I could never imagine anyone but myself reading it all the way through. And I can't promise you that I, even I did that once it was finished. And then I did not hear from her for several years, which is what usually happens. One loses touch. One day out of the blue, I received the most amazing letter from her filled with non sequiturs in a voice and tone I barely recognized. Something was off. She said she was writing while sitting in a wheelchair in the sunlight by a fence, that she had been in a near fatal accident over a year ago, that she had forgotten most of her previous life, but a few memories were now beginning to surface, that she vaguely recalled for some odd reason that first year seminar and some of its books. Her husband and children meant the world to her in her new state. She wasn't sure if this letter would ever reach me, whether I was still at JCU or if she even had the correct address. What she remembered most was that book on Stevens. For some reason, she knew it was important to her but forgot why. And of all things with her broken mind, she even quoted in her letter passages from it that I had forgotten I had written. But she said her copy of it was somehow lost or thrown out, that there was a space on her shelf where she knew that the book belonged. And the reason for this letter was to ask if there was some way she could get another copy. She closed the letter by saying that her mind was such that as soon as she finished the letter, she knew she would forget that she had written it, that she had uh, forget that she had made this request even. And if I did happen to send her the book, it would come as a surprise. It would be as though someone had sent her a gift for no reason that she could remember and that that would be a good thing if and when it happened. She would put it on her shelf where it belonged and would not remember that the other one was lost. Of course, I sent her a book and then I did not hear from her ever again. It's been decades, except for this. A few years back when the university was redesigning the Ignatian Pavilion outside the chapel, they initiated a campaign by which folks could purchase little brick pavers on which a name of choice could be engraved. I'm sure you've seen them. There are hundreds of engraved bricks on the sidewalk over there by the Ignatian Pavilion, names of people you have been treading on for years. And one day in the midst of this campaign, I received an official looking letter from someone in the advancement office announcing that a paver had been purchased in my name by this very person whom I knew for three months in a first year seminar course and whose subsequent and near, nearly tragic life story of which I know only the smallest bits and pieces has affected me deeply throughout the years. I have never looked for the paver with my name, but I think it's there. Some of the memories are humorous. There was a sincere young man who surprised me by, sub by not submitting one of the papers required in the course. When I reminded him it was late, he said, but I did submit it, told me its title, summarized its content. This was before computers when papers were typed once and then submitted when copies were rarely kept. I challenged him since I knew that I kept all papers in a single pile and had never lost one ever. He kept insisting that he had written it. I told him to check again and so would I. I could not find the paper. He seemed not the type to deceive and was sincere, but I was skeptical. I decided finally to consider the possibility that somehow I had lost it and gave him a grade for that paper, which was the average of his other grades in the class. Case closed, but I remained skeptical. I forgot the student's name, but always remembered the incident. 
10 years or so passed, you can predict what came next. On a reunion weekend, one of the many alums came up and introduced himself, said he had taken my course a decade ago and that he had something to say to me. He was sincere, respectful, half embarrassed. For 10 long years, he said, he had suffered guilt about a paper he never wrote, but told me he did. His guilt was more intense, he said, because I treated him so fairly. As, as soon as the confession was out of his mouth, I shouted, I knew it. I even forgot your name, but I knew it. Uh, we both laughed. I thanked him for honesty delayed. We agreed that his guilt was sufficient retribution and he went away feeling better, I expect. It would have been so easy for him to forget it. It would have been so easy for him not to approach me, um, but he did. Otherwise there would be no story to tell. Uh, no reason to tell it. And other memories are not as funny. Here, here is one I, I, I cannot forget. During my first year of teaching, I was assigned a course in modern drama, which I had never taught before and have never taught since. This was a summer course that met in the evening in late August in a room that had no air conditioning. We sweltered. I brought the graded research papers to the final exam. One of those papers had been copied word for word from an article on the playwright. And that student happened to be the first one finished with her exam. Once I located the published article, I discovered that the student had not only copied the article, but had gone to the trouble of using a thesaurus and had penciled in simpler synonyms above the words in the article that were too sophisticated for her to have used. There were hundreds of these pencilings. As she stood beside my desk on that very hot night, I asked if it was possible that the paper not might not represent her work. She was insulted and insisted that it was. As I presented evidence that it might not be, so quietly proud of myself, I looked up and she was wavering on her feet, eyes glazed, staring into blank space. I asked if she was okay and she said nothing. Alarmed, I stood and shifted her by the shoulders into my chair and she immediately lost consciousness, her head clunking onto the desk. Not a single student writing their final exam ever looked up. And there was I holding her by the shoulders to prevent her from falling onto the floor, feeling as though I had just murdered someone by entrapping her in a no exit conversation in front of an entire class. And so I stupidly said, does anyone have any smelling salts? The class erupted into action. Someone brought perfume saying this might make her sick but it will bring her to and it did both. Uh, with student help, we managed to get her to the stairs. The, this was in the basement. And then she fainted again. Once we were able finally to get her up the stairs to the open door in fresh air, she recovered into tears and panic, explaining that the course was way beyond her experience in literature, that she was desperate, that this was the final course of her college career, that a full-time job was waiting for her in two weeks. It was an awful scene, which I recall as if it happened yesterday, not over 52 years ago. Plagiarism is difficult, for any prof to tolerate. Yet this experience taught me early how badly one can handle such an issue. I had caught a culprit, but had forgotten the human being. She deserved better. In retrospect, my guilt was at least equivalent to hers. We worked it out. She graduated. I do not forget. She is among the precious butterflies. Another vivid recollection in 1992, on the day after, <clears throat> excuse me, on the day after a jury of 12 acquitted four policemen indicted for the brutal beating of Rodney King, which was caught unforgettably on videotape, you might remember, the cities of America were once again burning across the country. Riots were everywhere. I walked into a late afternoon class, which included a few graduate students and, and mostly undergraduates. By quirky coincidence, the novel Huck Finn was to be our center of discussion that day. The mood of the room was somber, 
defeated. So I trashed my plans <clears throat> and asked this simple question. Does anyone wish to discuss what's happening in the nation? Instead of the expected awkward silence, which such questions often produce at first, the single African-American student in the class seated in the back of the room raised his hand. And when I recognized him, instead of speaking from his chair, he rose and walked deliberately to the front of the room and took a position at the podium. Uh, he had no idea that this issue would even arise in the class, much less provide him an opportunity to discuss it. And yet he was propelled from his seat to the front of the class in the kind of extraordinary takeover of, 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 the, uh, of the position of, of, of authority in a way. Uh, his sadness, his disappointment, his anger, his sense of not belonging poured forth in the eloquence of intense and unprepared emotion. I moved to the back of the room and sat and listened for the entire class period as a brilliant black man shared his scarred soul with his mesmerized all white peers and his all white professor in a mostly all white institution. If folks remember that course, they remember it because of that particular day. Although I wish it could be recovered, its impact is that it cannot be recovered. In our discussion during the following class about a boy and a black man on a raft on the Mississippi River could not have been more deeply felt or more relevant to us all. A couple of memories relate to my mother and father whom I honor now by bringing them to you and whose four children, Barbara and Mary and my, my deceased brother, Joe and myself, amazingly all became educators, even though my parents could themselves not afford to attend college during the depression years. This recollection refers to a time at the end of a semester when I was a shiny new graduate assistant pretending that I knew what I was doing inside and outside the classroom. I suspect most professors have a story much like this one. I had taken my pile of final exams home to Pittsburgh to visit family on the weekend. I read the exams there, recorded the grades in a little green book, computed the final grades, tra-la, then I returned to Cleveland. This, is, that, this was when deadlines were extremely important to me, or so they seemed anyway. Grades were due, quote, no later than 4 p.m. in the registrar's office. This was pre-Canvas, of course. In fact, it was pre-computer too. Uh, TAs were doubly warned that somehow the university would crumble, the world would swoon if deadlines were not met. Played, playing it to the wire, a trait which has not much changed, I opened my briefcase at 2.30 to transfer the grades to the official sheet, but the green grade book was not there. It was on the coffee table in my parents' Pittsburgh living room, 130 miles away. After some brief panic, I realized I could simply call my mother and ask her to read the grades to me over the phone. When I reached her, she proudly announced that she had just 10 minutes ago dropped the grade book into the village mailbox. Uh, it, it will arrive in a couple of days, she assured me with some pride. Sensing my discomfort, my deep discomfort, uh, she said she would call me back and hung up. And here is the reason I am sharing this memory with you since it's an image that will not erase. Uh, my mother traipsed back to that village mailbox on a hot sunny day and sat beside it for over an hour waiting for the mailman to come to empty it. Then she beseeched him to give her that single piece of mail that she could prove was hers. He listened, he shook his head. She was an Irish mother and replayed the scene with great drama for years after it occurred. Probably breaking the law, the mailman picked the envelope from the pile and handed it to her. The grades were only a little bit late. And then there's this tale about my father. He was a graceful, simple man, yet a subtle, of subtle depth and wisdom. He fought in World War II from 1943 until 1945. 
And one day, a professor from our history department who was teaching a course on the Second World War asked me if my father, as a living relic of the war, might be willing to come up from Pittsburgh and share his experiences in front of a class of 60 or more students. As far as I knew, my widower dad had not been in the classroom since high school, and I doubted he would be willing to take this on. I was wrong. He did not even hesitate. Two or three weeks later, he strolled into the large classroom as if he owned it, hung his dress uniform, hat, and medals for display from the podium, sat down as if on an easy chair, and talked to or answered sophisticated questions for 75 minutes. By the end of the class, uh, by the end, the class was totally and fully with him. My wife and I sat amazed to hear it all, most especially when he responded to a question from the back of the room about the circumstances by which he was drafted into that war. He paused. Well, my wife never knew this. She thought I was drafted, but actually I volunteered. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so he had gone down with a bunch of his buddies and people of course were eager to get into the war and to, and to fight for a, an important cause in, in those days. It was so different from the Vietnam situation. Um, so here was something none of us in the family had ever known. And he shared it with a classroom of strangers in honest response to a question sincerely asked. This perhaps is the power of the classroom, although I must say we've often imagined uh, in another sphere what my mother was saying to him uh, about this. Spending half a century in the same career on the same campus might seem an awful waste of time, creativity, energy to some, a kind of settling in for life as if into a rocking chair. Yet I've never felt that I have done that. Emerson says, our minds travel when our bodies are forced to stay at home. And his buddy Thoreau, who rarely left tiny Concord, once said, my instinct tells me that my head is an organ for burrowing, as some creatures use their snout and forepaws. And with it, I would mine and burrow my way through these hills. I think that the richest vein is somewhere hereabouts. University life, especially being in the classroom, has provided the richest vein for my burrowing. From the outside, it may seem ordinary, repetitive, stultifying. From the inside, it's dynamic. Similar human needs arise among new faces. The same tired human issues resurface, yet the personalities are ever fresh with each four-year cycle. We who stay within these buildings over these many years cannot afford the luxury of intellectual complacency, careless stereotyping, of imposing old expectations upon new groups of students, even new young colleagues, who have every right to expect us to see them in there now, not in our stale sense of the good old days and how much they do not fit. From 1968 until this day, I have watched John Carroll reinvent itself over and again, even as I have been reinvented. We watch change happen. We worry about it. We become impatient and demanding and disappointed with it. It has often been ugly, small changes or large. Often enough, we can measure the physical evidence of progress Dormitory living space has at least tripled on the campus from what was once an old and clunky science building. Science departments now occupy a strategically designed castle at the head of our campus. The rickety pink barn that most don't remember that once housed the business school is now the university chapel. And the Bowler Business School occupies its own full wing of the ad building. A twice or thrice remodeled library rudders our academic ship, Th those tiny bank-like cubicle offices in the basement in which many humanities profs tried to find comfort and meaning have morphed over and again, finally becoming a fancy O'Malley Center, housing the departments of English languages and communications. Instead of sneaking under covers to study after midnight, 
Our students excel in the open air of their own excellence, regularly win national and international recognition for their scholarship, disdaining apathy. They volunteer in droves every semester to help the needy and poor in Ecuador, in Immokalee, Florida, on Native American reservations in the Midwest and Southwest, and in many other places and in many other ways. And our faculty, heart of the university, along with its students, comprise extraordinary scholars, prize-winning creative writers and teachers, fully committed to ensuring the vibrancy and the relevancy of what they do. If these recent months, especially in higher education and within our own academic home, have been sloppy and confusing and constructive, destructive, if we worry that external issues intrude upon internal equilibrium, that concerns over dollars threaten academic freedom and test the vibrancy of the liberal arts, we can at least savor the consolation, small though it might be, of looking backwards to realize that an inadequate system of checks and balances and an inadequate system of governance over many decades has still managed to produce the excellent university that we presently are. I wish to close these comments with a symbolic toast to those students to whom I am immensely grateful, whose names and personalities fill that pile of green grade books bound by old string on a shelf in my soon to be empty office, extending from 1968 until now. Each page in every book represents a classroom, large or small, squared, rectangular, circular, multi-tiered, in which we met, pondered, shared, challenged, often enough worried, often enough were disappointed, confused, sulky. Classrooms are not ideal places or ideal spaces, yet what happens in them can sometimes be so. The chemistry of trust that forms and gels in the brief time span of each semester often enough produces magical results. After years and years and years, that thrill when it happens is ever new to me but it does not happen all the time and it cannot exist without what students bring to it. Often enough, they do not know what they are expected to bring. The excitement of learning that very thing, what they are expected to bring is an intricate part of the entire magical process. It will be that magical space that I will most miss because of the invaluable persons over the years who have filled it. Permit me to end with a poem by a, fine, by a fine poet familiar to our campus, Billy Collins. He titles his poem, Schoolsville, and it captures in a brief space what I have spent too much time tonight trying to say. Hauntingly, Collins describes in the poem's final lines what my life might be like next semester and beyond. Schoolsville. Glancing over my shoulder at the past, I realize the number of students I have taught is enough to populate a small town. I can see it nestled in a paper landscape, chalk dust flurrying down in winter nights dark as a blackboard. The population ages but never graduates. On hot afternoons, they sweat the final in the park. And when it's cold, they shiver around stoves reading disorganized essays out loud. A bell rings on the hour and everybody zigzags into the streets with their books. I forgot all their last names first and their first names last in alphabetical order. But the boy who always had his hand up is an alderman and owns the haberdashery. The girl who signed her papers in lipstick leans against the drugstore smoking, brushing her hair like a machine. Their grades are sewn into their clothes like references to Hawthorne. The A's stroll along with other A's, 
the D's honk whenever they pass another D. All the creative writing students recline on the courthouse lawn and play the lute. Wherever they go, they form a big circle. Needless to say, I am the mayor. I live in the white colonial at Maple and Maine. I rarely leave the house. The car deflates in the drive. driveway, vines 15 years late, or a question about Yates or double spacing. And sometimes one will appear in a window pane to watch me lecturing the wallpaper, quizzing the chandelier, reprimanding the air. Thank you for being with me, everyone. Drink your milk, stay in school. <laughs> You're all welcome to cheer. This is the great unmuting. Wonderful. Thank you, Don. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well done, David. Thank you. 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 Oh, Captain, my Captain. <laughs> so uh, I, I do want to allow an opportunity. Thank you so much, David, for that beautiful talk. You know, I, do I said to allow people to. Um, I said, you're remembering night. Oh, sorry. Uh, to to be able to to speak with you directly, ask you a question. Um, but I just wanted to get just do a few housekeeping things. I wanted to thank, in particular, Eric Eikhoff for his help in. Um, in communicating and uh, working in advancement to, to help sort of, you know, summon everyone. We have a redoubtable number of 300, which has some mythic proportions, as you know, from Greek history, um, the Spartans um, defending against the Persians. Uh, that being said, this video will be recorded. I know some people may not have been able to uh, be at this event, um, and that's going to be shared through um, advancement. Um, also, I wanted to thank uh, Debbie Rosenthal. She did a lot of publicity and also ordered some goodies, which I, David, has a, has something sweet arrived at your yes, house? Yes, and it certainly has. <laughs> and I have not yet, I, 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 I sort of prevented myself from looking at it until after this was over, but I'm not only going to look at it. <laughs> well, He's going to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if someone would like to um, ask a question of David, um, if you could just click on the chat, you know, just that, that, that you'd like to, to mention something, um, and then I'll ask you to unmute and then uh, go for it. Well, we've had so many wonderful comments in the chat, David. We will uh, save them and make sure that you get this entire uh, list. Oh, oh, that would be great. Thank you. Reminiscences, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, as, as people are um, sort of thinking about maybe a question or something they want to share, because I know I, I, I wanted to share something with you, which is something that uh, your nephew shared with me, which is uh, a rather curious uh, <laughs> set of photographs. And I, I think I need a little bit of an explanation here. He, he better stay in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is John, John LaGuardia. Um, so who do we see here? Uh, you see me on the left, and I think that would be my sister Barbara on the right. And don't I look intelligent? <laughs> You've got the poet's moody glare for sure. <laughs> I'm planning a revolt. And how about this one? <laughs> oh my God. This is painful. Um, uh, this was a, I believe it or not, in high, in high school, I was in, I was in 11 plays. And this is a scene from a yearbook, I think, uh, from one of those plays. That's amazing. You're discobulous or something, right? Yeah, I'm a disc, I'm a discus thrower. This was, I'm a, I'm a high school with him? I wish I could ben, remember. <laughs> is it you can't take it with you? <laughs> might have been. It might have been. I think it was. You, you would remember that scene, Karen. <laughs> yeah. 
Great job. Yeah, well, I should have taken it with me. <laughs> That's uh, my, my brother Joe on the right. Um, I, I don't remember the occasion, but certainly that's a, I, I must have dyed my hair black then. <laughs> <laughs> I just love seeing these pictures. They're just. That's my special. sister Barbara. Um, oh, I can't believe he sent you these. These are, these are fun for me to look at. Yeah, yeah. There... Uh, my, my sister-in-law Bernadette, and I guess, um, what, what in the world am I wearing? Uh, uh, and that must be, that might be Jonathan there. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah, good old John. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I hope you're still on this call. I think he sent me a bunch of him and, uh, and, and you as well. This may be more, yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to share with you, uh, share with all of you a bit of uh, David's uh, illustrious um, photographic past. Um, <laughs> I, I actually see some questions here, um, and let me just, here's one from Kristen Coughlin. Um, who is a current author of a book you will think will be canon canonized as a classic? classic? Oh my goodness, um, that's an interesting question. Well, I, you know, um, I'm not sure that I, I could choose one, uh, but I certainly, um, the person who's already canonized and whom I have come to like so very, very much is is Toni Morrison, and I and I, I certainly feel that Toni Morrison, um, oh, yeah. her her reputation is just going to going to continue to soar, and and so if you're thinking of someone to read that you haven't yet read, um, I would by all means suggest going to her and and reading her with patience and care. She's she's just so fine. Wonderful. Um, Carol Lamb, would you like to ask your question? I was asking, um, what is your next chapter entitled? What's your next chapter entitled of your life? <laughs> I, I think it's uh, Shoveling the Snow, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which I've already done today. Uh, it's 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 going to be just just slowing down and in, and enjoying our life uh, together. Uh, I'm 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 getting old, so we have to enjoy it more quickly than we would have had to a few years back. That's right, Dave. Mm. Thank you, Jay. Um, so uh, another question from Dave Vitito: uh, What professor or staff member had the biggest impact on you when you were a student? I, I would have to say it was uh, Joe Cotter. Um, yeah. Uh, who's, who's, and Jay, you, you would have to remember and agree. I mean, he was- I agree, I agree, David. He was a, he was a phenomenal uh, professor and uh, so independent in the way he did things. And uh, people were, were nervous about him and kind of leery of him and afraid of him. Because of because of the, the the tone that he established, and yet you just fought to get into his classes, and and uh, uh, so yeah, I, I think it was Joe Carter. So a couple different questions about a favorite book and what you're reading now. Well, I usually answer that question. Um, Probably, perhaps some of the people who asked it have asked me before and, and heard this answer before. Um, I I try not to play favorites, and I I I try you know to to teach each text, you know as if as if it's the greatest text in the world, and and uh, to not kind of lean students one way or the other. I'll bet a lot of people would disagree. I probably I probably I'm leaning all the time, but. But uh, if if I can prevent a, present a book, you know, in its greatest strengths, and 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 also talk about whatever I feel or others feel might be its weaknesses, then that's a good conversation. But but I I surely enjoy teaching Absalom Absalom by William Faulkner. Um, that's a that's a head stretching book, and it's it's amazing in its content, and it's one of those books that. Um, you know, you, you have to come into it slowly, but once you let it happen to you, it, it, it's an intense kind of feeling. So it, th that's one of my favorite to teach. 
Deirdre, would you like to ask your question? Deirdre Burns. Sure, I, I asked in the chat, are you considering starting a Dr. LaGuardia's book club? Well, while you're retiring, I think you could possibly compete with Oprah and Reese Witherspoon based on the turnout. <laughs> that's, that's not a bad idea. Um, uh, my, my wife has always had this idea and she's, she's somewhere uh, that, that we should we should start a, a cookies and poems night uh, where, where people would come together and sort of have something to eat and we would share poetry readings and things like that in a really informal basis. Uh, I never thought about a book club, but we'd, ha we'd have to find a, a fitting auditorium, uh, I guess, to do that. It's great to see you, Deidre. I, <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while. Great to see you too. So maybe one more question and then uh, we'll just figure out some way of people thanking you individually. But um, I thought this was pretty interesting. Adriana, are you there? Adriana Nelson, you want to uh, ask her? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. All right. Hi, so Adriana. Hi. Uh, good seeing you again. And Same. my question was, what is one piece of advice that you would love to give to remaining faculty, alumni, and current students combined on emphasizing one's appreciation of literature? Wow. Um, Probably a big question. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, it's certainly, I guess it would be um, uh, read with an open mind. Uh, that is, you know, d don't, don't uh, jump too quickly to conclusions about a book or, or the writer. Uh, because what happens is once we have that kind of bias, it's hard to open up again to the possibility of that of that text or of that writer. So, so it's to sort of keep hold back from from I love that book or I hate that book. Uh, give it time first, and and uh, now I, I better stop there. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's wonderful, question. wonderful countercultural advice given our uh, current moment where we're so um, in a hurry to judge, to either praise or to condemn. I think that that's something that we can all um, yeah. keep thinking about as how we move forward and no. in, in a society that seems so strained and so broken in so many ways. That's wonderful. Um, well, we, uh, I know some people right, are, have, uh, we still have 200 here. So I, I just, I just kind of want to leave it up. And if people would like to unmute, just take turns and, uh, and thank David if you'd like. But I think all of you, one last uh, note in that, that is to say that John McBratney will be retiring at the end of next semester and we will be offering a last lecture. So, um, so if, if this was enjoyable to you, even if you don't know John, but certainly if you do, I would love for you to join us. And we'll try to figure out this, uh, this cap on 300 since it, it appears that this is a popular event. So uh, thank you. Thanks again, David. Um, would anybody like to just unmute and say hello? Yeah, can I say hello really quickly? Chris. Hey, Dr. LaGuardia. How are you? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm fine. Um, I how's, the de how's the dental profession? <laughs> it's wonderful. And I wanted to say to you um, that I use that I use a lot of what you taught me in our English classes when I speak to new patients every day. Um, oh my God. Because, because you taught me in our classes. Right. So for everyone listening, I'm in dental school at Ohio State. I'm a fourth year. Um, and I took a lot of Dr. LaGuardia's classes, but but the way that you always made sure that we knew that a character existed within a very diverse and moving and fluid context in every layer of their lives that has influenced them has been so monumental in my own patient care because it helps me see not just the teeth but the person and the story that's led to the teeth and why they're in my chair. So I just wanted to wow. say thank you so much and you're very much a part of my practice daily um, when I'm seeing my patients. My goodness, thank, thank you for saying that. Goodness. Hi, Dr. LaGuardia. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Great to see you. Pittsburgh, um, right? I know, I know. Um, I wanted to, I was so excited to see Alex Wells too, and I wanted to piggyback 
<laughs> off of what he said. Um, I'm a, I'm a radio host now here in Pittsburgh. I work for iHeart. Oh my. Yeah, and I, um, a lot of people ask me what I majored in, if I majored in broadcast journalism. And I, they're usually surprised when I say that I majored in creative writing. And I was, most of my time at JCU was spent uh, with you or Dr. Metris or, uh, you know, in the English department, the O'Malley Center. And I, uh, I think people undervalue how much of a wordsmith you have to be when you are behind a microphone and how you have 15 seconds to tell a 60 second story. And I use a lot of what I learned with you and at John Carroll uh, to apply that into my, uh, into my career and uh, you can do anything with an English degree. So. Wow, Katie, that's, that's wonderful. We should get more majors as a result of this, Phil. <laughs> Hi, Dr. LaGuardia, it's uh, Maureen Ginley. Um, just to kind of speak to what uh, Alex and Katie both said, I take what I learned in your classes and throughout other, you know, courses at John Carroll through my career now, I'm a UX content writer for a bank. Um, and when you think about UX, you think sometimes just about the products, but it's really about creating the experience for the whole person. And throughout a lot of my courses, I was able, with you, I was able to learn how to speak to people as a whole. And you know, sharing the John Carroll experience with my dad. He still talks about how you helped him during his time at John Carroll. So you're very special to the Ginley family. Well, I remember meeting your, your dad at, at some event, uh, not, you know, several years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he saw Meeting him again, that is, yeah, meeting him yeah. again. He saw you in the corner. He's like, I'm too nervous to go say hello. <laughs> okay. yeah. Yeah. I'm so scary. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Best of luck in your retirement. Thank you. Hello, Dr. LaGuardia. It's Eric Meljack. Hello, Eric. You How are me? you? Hello. You're down there in Texas. I am down in Texas, uh, in the yellow city, Amarillo. So, <laughs> but uh, I have to say thank you. I never thanked you. Um, in, in 2000, um, you gave me a D on a paper. <laughs> um, because because uh, it was the red badge of courage and um, I kept calling the main character I think Henry Fielding um, <laughs> and um, the paper was just a total mess and I thought I was going to bomb your class and you gave me an A for the class so thank you uh, 20 years too late but thank you for passing me in that class so that Listen, I uh, the, the, the word is out I am a softie yeah, you're a softie, but you are a good softie. Thanks for all you've done. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Good Hi, luck Dr. To you. Hi, Dr. LaGuardia. I, I have to piggy bank off of Eric because I don't know if you remember this, but I hope you do. So the first paper I ever wrote for you was on Hemingway's iceberg theory. And you told me the ideas were fantastic, but the writing nearly sunk the ship. <laughs> and <laughs> I remember... <laughs> I remember coming to you and telling you, I can do better, I can do this, I can do this. And four years later, when you were helping me write probably my fifth draft of my master's essay, you asked me if I remembered that paper and how you knew that I was a serious student when I actually rewrote that paper. So thank you for challenging me and pushing me. And uh, I think about just how much your love of Faulkner has influenced my life in the way that I want to share that same love of reading with my students. Thank uh, you. Uh, well, well, good luck. Please do it. That's great. Thank you. Hi, Dave. It's Mike Haggerty. I don't know Hi, if Mike. you remember me, but I, I think I may have met you um, earlier than anybody in this group because I met you orientation week 1964. Oh, my God. <laughs> when I was a freshman and you were a, a senior. And oh then my, my last class at John Carroll was that modern drama class. I remember the smelling salts story. Oh, you took that class. Oh my goodness. I don't know if you know this, but I needed an A to graduate in August in that class. It was my last class. If I didn't get an A, um, my uh, average in my major was gonna be too low to graduate. I don't know if you knew that, but I got the A. I wrote a paper on uh, Streetcar Named Desire. It was oh one my of my goodness. favorite classes. I, I, I doubt that I knew it. Uh, 
because that might have made it harder for you to get the A. <laughs> <laughs> well, great to see you, Mike. That's wonderful. Hi, Dr. Hi, Dr. LaGuardia. Oh, oh no. Hi. Sarah, uh, hi. Sarah here. Um, Last time I, I talked to, to you, you were, you were heading to where, England or? Yes, yeah. So I, I finished my master's in London and now I'm in New York City, uh, oh, locked sorry. down in my four by four apartment. But um, I wanted to, to hop on and say thank you for everything that you've done through um, you know, your experience at John Carroll. I know you touched my life as well as many others. And um, my first class with you was the uh, special seminar on Robert Frost. And yes, I walked sir. into that class hating Robert Frost. And you know, you'd said to me, you know, we'll see if we can change your mind by the end of the semester. And you taught me to, to read and appreciate things um, in, a, in a respectful and a, a thoughtful manner. And whenever I think, you know, whenever I see anything Robert Frost related, I, I think of you in that class and how much I enjoyed it. So wanted to hop on and say thank you so much for, for changing my perspective and, and teaching me how to be an intentional reader and writer. Um, it's, I, I'm so appreciative of you. So good luck in your retirement and it's great to see you again. Thank you, Sarah. It's great to see you too. Thanks. Hi, Dr. Gordia. I um, just want to say thank you for all the uh, okay, hi. time and effort you put into uh, giving us attention as well as just um, being the open to other literature and <laughs> making me open to more American literature, especially Faulkner, which I write quotes on my daily board at the Cleveland Clinic now. Yeah, so, I was going to say you were well. You were really um, responding to him in such a kind way. I mean, that, that was it was great to see it. It's, uh, it's something else, and still going to read it. Still busting through Absalom Absalom again. <laughs> All right, good, good for Thank you. Thank you. Great, good to see you. You too. Dr. LaGuardia, this is Steve Raglow. Uh, Steve, hi. How are you? You remember I, I flew into your class that day, uh, interrupted your um, peanut butter and apples. <laughs> Almost every day I had the same thing. And I have the book that you taught my son, Paul, who would have been in one of the last of your classes. And I'm so glad that he got into your class. and. Um, so I have two generations of, of Raglos that, that have been taught by you. And I just want to say that the impact that you had and about the value of, of being a critical thinker and a reader, and that that really is the essence of what life is. Um, I got out of teaching uh, 20 years ago, but I can't believe how much the the, the fact of, of um, still being, being, being totally involved in reading and remembering the, the, the books that I read years and years ago. And it, you know, it's, it, it's just amazing the, the impact that it has as a lifelong um, endeavor. You know, and uh, you know, I, I just wanna throw one other thing at you and that is, um, I've often thought, you know, how much Toni Morrison, because I knew you, you know, I took your Faulkner seminars. And then when I read Toni Morrison in graduate school, it was such, it, it seemed to me like she was finishing Fa uh, Faulkner. She was answering Faulkner and, and challenging that whole, his, his vantage point. And it's just amazing to me that these, these writers can can carry the, the American experience and message and challenge one another. I just wonder if, because uh, wow. I was too early for her, she was just coming out then. I have to believe that you would have taught some sort of course that would have been Faulkner to to Morrison or something. Is there, you know? Oh, that would be a great course to teach. It was, it's always hard to teach two people in, in one course if you're trying to do a seminar, because I have found, because you shortchange both of them instead of spending enough time on one. But, but you, you probably know that, that um, Toni Morrison wrote her master's essay uh, on Virginia Woolf and William Faulkner, so that so the, the influence and the respect is very, very much there. 
Uh, Faulkner, of course, continues to get, there's a recent article, article in the New Yorker where he's pretty much revealed for being racist in his letters and racist in his day-to-day -day commentary, but he totally contradicts that racist attitude in his fiction. And, and so it's, it's, it's a really interesting, you know, bifurcation of, of an amazing artist. So thanks for, for, I'm glad you still love these folks as much. And I would read Morrison more if, you know, you'll, you'll see the relationship. I'm losing my yourself. battery. Hi, Dr. LaGuardia, um, Alyssa Fliggy. I, um, I probably only had uh, one or two classes with you and it's, it's been a minute, but um, I'm so grateful that you, you stayed with teaching after uh, 2008, that was my first year at Carroll. And so I, I didn't realize that you um, had been stepping down from uh, administration at that point um, and might not have returned to teaching. So I'm so grateful that you did stay. And um, I, uh, in, a, in a completely different um, direction than Steve's beautiful insights, um, I think you'd appreciate to know that um, I've always referred to uh, just thinking my classes with you fondly. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever shared with you, but I, I always liken your voice to being like a white Morgan Freeman. Um, and so in your retirement, um, <laughs> who, 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 who kind of is a blend of, um, you know, uh, Theodore Geisel, uh, Dr. Seuss and Hemingway in appearance. So that's how I fondly have described you in, in years passing with, with other alumni. And um, so definitely not the depth of Steve's comments, but uh, no, I'm uh, joking with a couple other um, alumni that are, are in the same video here. Um, we joked that you should uh, consider in, um, you know, I'm, I'm a high school English teacher, so I, I definitely would not know what to do with free time. So I'm sure you will, you know, be in a kerfuffle looking for what to do, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> but um, if you find you are looking for something to fill your time, we, we definitely think that there could be a great career for you in voice acting or reading audiobooks because um, past students and I have always uh, celebrated just how love, much we love your voice and that you could narrate anything wow. and people would stop Thank and you. be captivated. So. Well, send me <laughs> contracts. <laughs> <laughs> if I can find them, I will. <laughs> so thank you, and um, just yeah, thank you for the legacy that you've you've left with all of us. Um, at a, a school, um, I went from John Carroll to Indianapolis through a teaching program, getting my master's in education, and was fortunate enough to teach AP English for several years, and um, end up using, inspired by your 20th Century American Lit class, um, the two texts, um, Sound and the Fury, and Farewell to Arms, and having students. Um, uh, use those in place of a couple of texts that um, I found more difficult for students to engage with. And yes. so um, I just, I, I remember looking back at your notes on, on those and just have always appreciated um, the insights and the depth with Faulkner and everything. So thank you for sharing that with us. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Alyssa. Really Congratulations it. and enjoy thanks, uh, your retirement. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> hey, Dr. LaGuardia. Uh, it's been uh, many years. I mean, more than three decades. I wonder how many people on this call have had both your brother and you, because um, I had him at Lake Catholic. Oh, my. And I had you for a couple of classes. That's wow, that's touching. Um, yeah. You had him for English. I had him for English. He was he was an administrator, but he'd yes. step in and he would teach classes. He was so the assistant was principal there. Yes, exactly, exactly. So I knew him very well. I was in his office a lot. <laughs> yeah, great guy. Well, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's that's really meaningful, Joe. Thanks for for sharing that with me. Well, and you know, I just want to thank you. Uh, I I was I taught for a little while after Carol. Um, you know, and but I I ended up going into business, but I I still read every day, and that is, you know, a gift that the school gave me. That uh, you know I can't be back. Yes, I understand, uh, and and that it means that much to you is what makes it all worth it for us. Uh, so that's wonderful, Joe. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Guardia. Ellie, it's hi. <laughs> there, there, there's the child. Yes, I'm teaching your youngest student tonight. Um, he fell asleep, but I don't think that was the content. Um, but I just wanted to thank you for everything and thank you for your friendship uh, during my time at John Carroll. And I wish you the happiest retirement. 
Oh, thank you very much. And don't 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 stop writing me your little notes. I enjoyed them. Great. Happy holidays. Thank you. Same to you. Bye bye. David. <laughs> thank you for the topic. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. you. And I am amazed by your 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 lecture, your memory. It is remarkable. Well, I and, had to work at it. And I think, and I think uh, I will always miss you when we were just walking on the second floor of the O'Malley Center. I don't, I don't uh, understand how it will be without you. Oh, thank you. Really, uh, you, in my personal life, you have a great impact. And that is you hired me for John Carroll University. So you are the one who interviewed me when I came to John Carroll. Oh, that's that's right. Of course. So that's why you are like the connection. You know, it's so, and and I have a great memory. Uh, and actually, as was Elisa, I think when she said, you have to have audio books. You remember I told you this uh, maybe ten years ago, and I said, you know, when when I listen to someone who is reading Rumi's poetry, you come to my mind. Wow. Because really, it is like your voice. So please do something in that regard. I, you remember I said that, I think. Wow. Yeah. So, well, please help me out on this, because I have I no will, idea how to, how, to, how to move forward on this plan. <laughs> actually, we, some, some people suggested that uh, you, we should have like a book club. I think it would be wonderful to have this connection. Uh, and and we, we because we like always to be in the gathering like that you have you know yes and I think um, that way we will a little bit you know cover our uh, our missing basically yes oh how nice how nice I, I concur and I think maybe we'll get advancement to maybe set something up so that uh, your um, so my voice is preserved. Exactly. And you remember sometimes I would say, does people in New York giving you any, any money for naming LaGuardia Airport after your last name? And you said, no, actually, they don't give me any money for that. But I told you that they treat me well there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they get totally confused. They don't, because they look at the ticket and they see LaGuardia and they think that something's missing and they don't know what to do with it. Yes. <laughs> David, are are you are you feeling uh, ready to be done? I I I don't I do want to make sure that um, I I don't I just want to not trample on your. I, energy. I'm I'm fine. If people have have want to say something, I'm enjoying it. So okay, wonderful. No, let's, no let's keep going then. I'm I'm happy to stay. But but. Hi, buddy. <laughs> right. <laughs> Relatives. <laughs> we figured. We should say something too. Oh, how nice. We were sort of representing. Hi, Clara. Hi. Hi. <laughs> we're representing Michael, who is, as oh, you I, know, not. Yes, I, I know. And well, apparently there's going to be a recording, which he can see. Uh, yes. This is my daughter in law, folks, and, and, my, and two of my four grandchildren. So how nice to see them. I, I, I haven't seen you this way in a long time. <laughs> well, we just wanted to say congratulations, and we really. Um, enjoyed watching um, you speak about your career and seeing all your colleagues and we know that everybody appreciates you so much. Thank you. And we can't so wait to be part of your retirement. <laughs> yeah, right. If we can ever get this world back together. We will. <laughs> we will. We will. <laughs> Bye. Great seeing you. Dr. LaGuardia, I just want to say that from you, CJ here, I got less than two weeks till I graduate and I've passed my test, so I'm on my way to becoming oh, a teacher. Oh, nice, CJ. So That's great. You were my first uh, professor for English that I had, and you definitely made the impact on the importance of a reread on a book when we did The Scarlet Letter, because I remember I hated that book, and you had, it, had us reading it, and I learned to appreciate that book. And also, I remember you telling me that I always said hi to you when you came into the classroom. And I want you to know, I do that even in a digital world to every one of my students. So congratulations uh, one, on retirement. One remembers those things. Uh, so good for, good for you and good luck to you. Thank you. And when you get those voiceover books, let me know where I can buy them. Okay, okay. they'll be at the local uh, McDonald's. Uh. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes. <laughs> Hi, Dr. LaGuardia, Liz Malloy. Um, Hi, Liz. How are you? First, super strange. Some of my students were actually on this call because they're now college students who oh I highly encourage to sign up for your class. Good for you. <laughs> um, but second, I just, as a teacher, am increasingly grateful for how you were able to perform works for us and then also use silence to surround them and really open it up. Today, we were all remote, so my kids were all on Zoom like this, and we're staring at each other, and one kid on the way out goes, you know, Miss Malloy, we had a really great story time today. We learned a lot about that Odysseus guy, and <laughs> it was so beautiful knowing it worked because I guarantee he didn't understand most of it, but, but he heard what it was supposed to sound like, and he knew that it was exciting, and he knew that it was energetic, and he knew that there was an odyssey behind it. And so much of that comes from semesters in your room and actually hearing those words out loud instead of in my own brain on a couch at two in the morning. So, so thank you for just, <laughs> again, using your voice, but also sharing so much of those pieces out loud with us. I remember you, especially for a conversation we had about Huck Finn in class and you were talking about the students in school and, and uh, the impact of, you know, of Huck Finn on high school students. So, yep. Still a you conversation that gets me fired up to this day. I'll bet it does. I'll bet <laughs> it does. <laughs> Thank you. Good seeing you, Liz. Dr. LaGuardia, I have to show you my... Oh, my goodness. That's beginning to look like my copy. You have read it. <laughs> Woo! And all the notes. Oh my, that is, that's impressive. Oh my, from <laughs> way back. classes I ever had. You know, I think we, I, I, I taught that seminar probably only twice and I wish I had taught it more, but it was so, the, the poetry is so hard for students that, that it was, I think, you know, didn't attract them in the same way that some of the other classes might. Yeah, this, it was like, I took this in philosophy of the mind at the same time with, was it, uh, what was his name? Mr. Cotter as well? Different Cotter? That taught philosophy? Uh, I don't I know. remember his name. But anyway, I took him at the same time. They were so, it, it was like... Sweeney, maybe? I can't remember, but it was, uh, it, was, it was like the two were such a great compliment. But anyway, loved all of your classes. Took you many times. You and Mr. Cotter, nice to hear you reference him. So thank you. You're welcome. Great to see you again. You too. Dave, David, Sally and I uh, attended your lecture. I, I'm sort of a vicarious student. If I it hadn't been it. for Sally, I would never have had the privilege of hearing this wonderful lecture as you reviewed your life. I only regret that I never got a chance to take a class from you. Oh, but huh, but nice. maybe maybe when you and Sally have, share your uh, original pancake <laughs> breakfast, <laughs> I can come along and learn something. <laughs> By all means, I think I would be learning as much from you, Stanley. <laughs> Those of you who know, this is, this is uh, Dr. Sal Sally Wertheim's husband, Stanley. And so glad to see you. you're both well, I hope. Well, we're hanging in there. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for letting me join this. Oh, thanks Appreciate for joining. <laughs> uh, Dave, this is Fred Barr. Hi, Fred. Hi, who also started John Carroll in 1961. Oh, I we were on the same same floor in, in Dolan Hall. Yeah, we had rooms next to each other for two years. Exactly. And, and probably no one else know, here knows what a great uh, intramural basketball player Dave was. Those were the good old days, yep, when I could run. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just to let you know, I, I did have a, a course at the Cleveland Ecumenical Institute with your, your brother Joe. Oh, wow. And, and Bernadette, and certainly enjoyed them. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I, Bernadette might be, I hope she was able to watch. She's, she's in Buffalo, and um, so she'd be happy to know that and to hear that. So yeah. I'll be sure to tell her if, if she hasn't watched. Thanks for bringing that, that up, Fred. I have great memories from that hallway. Oh yeah, isn't that the truth? 
<laughs> yep. Uh, just great memories. A few, a few years ago, I feel like I'm the only person on here who's not a uh, literature major. Yeah, what happened to you? Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I went to the dark side. <laughs> I didn't have my conversion clothes on yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, good luck to you in your retirement. Uh, uh, I retired myself a few years ago, and it's, you know, you, you really get to do what you want to do. Thank you, Fred. Good luck to you also, and it's wonderful to see you. Okay, Joe. Bye-bye. Dave. Dr. LaGuardia. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> it's me. I'm scared to talk, but I'm just going to ad-lib my Why? way through this. <laughs> so, um, Last time I, just, I saw you, you had a camera in your hand, and you were taking <laughs> pictures. Do you remember? I was doing a lot of soul searching that year, and I think you were part of that in a lot of ways. Um, but what I remember, one of the one of the main things I remember is I had just left to do some of that searching in New Zealand, and I was going to be late to your course by like a month. And you're like, "That's fine. Just write a journal, turn that in, <laughs> and we'll see how it goes." Um, and I found myself throughout the trip just like recording all of these very like personal things that were going through my head. I didn't realize how personal it actually would be until I got it back from you. And I'm seeing like all of these exclamation points and like <laughs> the circles. And I just, I really felt like you had this incredible ability to really make someone feel listened to and heard and and I'm gonna get sad, <laughs> but I just really appreciate that. And happy shuffling. <laughs> I will always be thankful for your classes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Drop a note anytime you want. Great to see you again. <laughs> Hi, Dr. LaGuardia. Hi. I hope, I hope you don't remember me because I like to pride myself as being a ninja, even though I sat in front of you in the class because my eyesight is so terrible and I thought they'd be rolling the board. If I sat back, I wouldn't be able to see. <laughs> but um, I just want to say congrats and shout out from the Bahamas. Um, I'm not oh, wow. anywhere cold um, where you guys are at, but um, just wanted to say hi and congrats and all the best. Oh, thank you ever so much. It's, it's great to hear from someone so far away. <laughs> Not that far away. I don't think so. It's not that far. Okay. No, it's not that far. It's only about uh, 45 minutes flight to Florida and then about two and a half hours by plane to get to Cleveland from there. So not, not that far. Okay. Okay. Good. David, Good to will, see you. Will, you, will your John Carroll email be active in your emeritus? I'm, I surely hope so because I don't know what I'll do without it. Uh, okay. So if people want to email me by that, and if, if they do email me, remember that it's not, it's LaGuardia, not D LaGuardia. So you have to not put the D on it. It's LaGuardia at jcu.edu. Great. Thanks. Hey, David. Yes. David, can you hear me? This is George Bill uh, Let's see, where do you work? I work at John Carroll. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm communicating with you from the cultural center of the world, Cleveland Heights. Oh, I've been there. I've been through there. In and fact, I, I used to live there. <laughs> I just wanted to, I wanted to just mention one little thing. Well, two things really. The first is my first year at John Carroll, way, way back, I think it was 29 years ago. We were both a lot, we both had black hair. I remember that. Um, I was teaching at my- on a dye, it's called. Yeah, right. Giuliani die. Um, I was teaching a class in modern poetry and a, a weakness of mine was Wallace Stevens. And the course came to the Wallace Stevens time. And I had to reckon with this uh, titanic figure. And one of the poems we were going to read was a, a high toned old Christian woman which I read many times with more or less total incomprehension. <laughs> And I came to your office and I said, I have to talk to the class about this poem tomorrow. And you said, I'll just come and talk to the class about a high-toned old Christian woman. And you, you came in and you gave this wonderful lecture about the poem. And I sat in the back of the room nodding, 
you know, sagely saying, yes, he's right about this. He's right about that. <laughs> the whole class thought I was you know, brilliant for bringing you in. And I just wanted to thank you for, for saving, saving me that time and many other times. And really for, um, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, I really modeled much of my teaching after watching you teach and observing your technique and your manner in the classroom. And uh, in small imperfect ways, uh, you live on in, in my teaching, although I could never hope to equal you as a, as a teacher or, or as someone who made the students really understand the importance of literature. So I, I wanted to thank you for that, David. Oh, George, I'm so, I'm so flattered and humbled. Uh, coming from you, that's, uh, those are wonderful comments. Thank you. I, I, I doubt that I deserve them nearly so much, but thank you. David, I'd like to follow George. It's Lauren. <laughs> Hi, Lauren. So um, I didn't get to sit and watch you teach English, but I just want to say that I learned from you as a colleague, as a mentor, everything that your English colleagues said about you as a faculty member, I experienced um, as an administrator or trying to learn how to be one from you. And I still draw upon your grace and your wisdom and your kindness, uh, or I try to in the work that I do. A couple of stories I remember long time ago, I sent an errant email and I won't go into all the details for the crowd, <laughs> <laughs> but you were responsible for issuing the rebuke to me for my misstep. And you did it with such humor and kindness, even as you were being stern in trying to, um, you know, demonstrate to me the error of my ways. And then a few years later, you had to deliver some um, professional news to me that I didn't take easily or happily. It was a hard decision. Um, and in that you taught me and showed me how to see a path forward and how to understand what really mattered and what had value. And so your remarks tonight about how a great university persists even when we disagree um, in higher education, whether it's at John Carroll or other places and that our commitment to, to learning and to inquiry and to supporting students is really what sustains us. And I just wanted to say thank you um, for all that you've provided to John Carroll students, but also to John Carroll faculty and John Carroll administrators and those of us who don't work at John Carroll anymore. So um, thank, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Lauren is, if those who don't know, Lauren is is a provost herself. And and so what, what she says has, has a strong, <laughs> strong base uh, of, of comparison. And we had we had wonderful times together in that despite all the tumultuous times that we, that, that, that there were. Thanks, it Lauren. Was so lovely to be able to be here and um, and hear your remarks. So. Great, thanks. I'm glad you came. Hi, Dr. Laguardia. Um, this is Allie Gall. I had you in 2011 or 2012 Hi, uh, for your lit class, and um, I just want to tell you I struggled mightily in your class when I had you, and I that class stressed me out so badly. Um, I had just transferred to JCU and I felt completely and utterly over my head. Oh. And um, I can look back now and with age and wisdom, I see how much I learned in your class about myself, about the world, about literature. And I, I wish I had the ability to retake that class now with all I know. Um, and all I've learned. And uh, I just want to say thank you for You're being uh, wildly influential, even though I struggled and had a hard time. Uh, thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, you are infinitely intelligent and wise and so appreciated. You better take out the infinite, but thank you very much. <laughs> I really appreciate your comment. <laughs> That's great. Thank uh, you. It's all. It's it's actually wonderful to hear comments from those who you know did, you know weren't as comfortable uh, and and yet yet still grew. That's that's a great thing. Thank you very much, Ali. Hi, Dr. Laguardia. I just wanted to uh, thank you. Yes, hello. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for uh, everything. 
uh, that you shared today, but also everything that you shared with me is uh, when I was one of your students, I uh, currently teach now my own students at Lorain County Community College in Tri-C Wonderful. as well. And I have the pleasure to share with them um, Sherwood Anderson's Winesburg, Ohio. Terrific. And every semester that I get to share this book with them, I, I, I do think back to those moments when you shared this book with me. And I, I you know, I, I, to echo George Vilgare from earlier, I, I don't know if I could ever live up to what you shared, but, um, and not that I, I would, I would want to necessarily, but I, yeah, I, I just want to thank you. You find your voice and, and, you know, you have a lot of talent, Josh. <laughs> so, and I, it was, it was great to have you in my classes. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. LaGuardia, how are you doing? I'm Joe. well. How are you, Joe? Yeah, good to see you. Thanks for doing this for all of us, too. This has been just such an awesome night and just hearing everything you had to say. Something I really wanted to commend you for, too, that I think you have just an uncanny ability for is having such an influential way with words, but not having to be so, like, boisterous about everything, right? And you have this control of a classroom without having to carry the big stick, if you will, right? You say what you want to say in a way that is poised and in a way that is clearly entirely influential upon so many of your students. And I think that is something that is, uh, that I've definitely taken from you, particularly outside of everything that has to do with literature. I mean, I remember rapping back and forth with you about Faulkner, yes. and Hobson yes. family, but that is something uh, that I very much so commend you for and think is a great lesson to learn, so. Thank you very much, Joe. Some some of that is so unconscious, you know. You don't you hardly know what you're doing, um, and that's it's it's the way that it, that it comes across. And uh, but but um, so however it comes across when it works, I'm I'm delighted that it does. Absolutely, it's because it stems from your heart, you know. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Out there. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for being able to even say things like that. That's great. I, I hate to do this to, to jump in again, even though I already had my chance. Um, when I returned to Carroll, one of the things that kind of really saddens me to this day is um, Father Shell and I, I really became close with him and, 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 and John Carroll uh, became synonymous with, with Father Shell and I always could count on him being there. But you were also one, it's just, I didn't, I don't have the, I didn't have the sadness for you because you were always still there. <laughs> what, what I want yeah. to know is because those it's the story of my life I'm always still there <laughs> well that's wonderful but we take for granted what is in front of us don't we and um, I just want to know because Father Shell was such an Im a huge impact on me and I think he was an enormous impact on the school I think you've been an enormous impact in the school and I don't know to what extent you and Father Shell uh, might have interacted and I, and I wonder if you have a story or so from that. You know, um, I don't, and I, I wish that I did. I, I think that um, as a, I don't believe as a student, he was teaching logic then um, primarily. And I, I believe I must have taken that class, which was required from, from someone else. Uh, and then I'm not even sure when I was a young faculty member, what role he played, but he was in administration mostly, and he wasn't in a context where I had the opportunity to get to know him very well as as a person. He was much admired, and then of course he became president and had a really rough presidency because of the sociology of the time. And and um, uh, so so I, I I guess I I guess I don't uh, have you know, many stories like that. I, I, what I remember most about him is he had this wonderful dry wit. And, and once they named, named the Shell House after him, he would always say, well, I'm going over to my house now. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, with a twinkle in his, in his eye. So, so but, but he, was, he was a powerful force. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Gallagardia. Hi, how are you, Liam? <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm coming as a spy from Ohio State, um, and I'm sure you, let, you left us. Okay, but I'm back. 
Um, and I'm sure there's much more deserving people to speak um, and to congratulate you, but I have to go. And I just wanna say thank you so much for the work you've done. And uh, the, my, the American Lit class was my favorite class I've ever taken in college, even at Ohio State. Wow. And I feel like at the end of each lecture, I gained a little bit of truth of the human narrative. And I really appreciate that. Thanks, and Sam. It's cool that you brought the magic of the classroom to Zoom tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you, Liam. That's great. Thanks. Good luck in, in Columbus. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Look who it is. Yes, we're joining you from Chicago. What a nice house you have. Oh boy, it's very messy back there, don't look. <laughs> um, we've been sitting here and as everyone's talking, um, just a lot of memories started flooding back. Um, and I had David for my very first class, my first semester at Carroll. Um, and I was a nervous little freshman and just so happened to be placed in a class where it was like all juniors and seniors. And um, I remember the first day David asked if there were any first years and I was so mad at him because I was anxious. It was literally my first college class ever. Um, and so- he Did you lie? Like, no, I raised my hand and I was very mad at you. Um, but in that class, you really pushed me to find my voice. And I started taking a lot of other classes with you. Um, and I became one of those students who took every LaGuardia class there was, except for the Stevens one, which someone has mentioned already. And um, I remember always asking you to teach that class. And eventually one day, Anthony and I bought books and you set out time for us to just study Stevens in your office, um, even though you weren't gonna have the seminar class. Um, and that was we, really meaningful to both of us just to have that time together. And, and we did that pretty much the whole semester, didn't we? Yeah. It was, um, wonderful. it was wonderful for me too. Just for a professor who has so many obligations to set aside time like that for two students, um, I think speaks to who you are um, and just the impact that you have um, on everyone. And I just love hearing the stories. Another little anecdote I wanted to share was the day in the library when Anthony and I realized that you pretty much had read every book of criticism there was in any author you were teaching because your notes were in every book in the library. So why not leave your legacy here and all the- I deny it, I deny it. Your legacy is in the library and hopefully will stay there for, for future students to come. Um, and I, I just wanted to add to, to what Rachel's already said. Um, speaking of impact, I think, um, so, so Rachel was the one who pushed me. I was a science major my freshman year. She pushed me to take, and Dr. Maroney's nodding. She was my, my advisor. Um, Rachel pushed me to take one of your classes, which happened to be a, a conversion experience for me. Um, and so, so I think that was my sophomore year. I ended up taking you um, the major American writers class. Somewhere. I know exactly where you sat. Go ahead. <laughs> um, and uh, well, so there, there were a few moments in that class that I just wanted to bring up. One was, one day I was wearing a hoodie uh, and you walked in and it, it had the name of my high school on it. And you pointed at it and you said, Christian Brothers. Uh, and uh, we, we found out that we went to the same high school. Um, yes, so we did. An, aston uh, an astonishing moment. And then the, the other thing was, there was one day um, where I, I didn't do the reading in class. And it, it seems that no one else had either. So you, you, know, you walked in and I think you got the sense that in the room, not many people um, had completed the assignment. And uh, of course, this was the one day ever in any of your classes that, that was ever the case for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. You said, yeah. <laughs> you said um, and I, I wrote this down and when you were saying it, um, you said you cannot afford the luxury of simplicity when there's complexity out there. Uh, and that kind of prompted the rest of the, the class discussion and, um, that, that line has just always stuck with me um, in terms of just like, you know, intellectual, um, just the, the need and desire to continue exploring and, and to never be satisfied with what we already know or what we already think we know. Really. Wow. Um, oh, nice. And oh, so, nice. so that was a moment that has stuck with me um, on into to grad school here in Chicago. So uh, we just wanted to say thank you so much uh, for all of your time.
Well, you you two have been an amazing presence in in my life, and so thank you. And those of you who who are still with us and don't know these these folks met at John Carroll and became English majors together, and then and then married, and and they're living their happily ever after life in in, in Chi Town. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, it's great to see you both. <laughs> go right after them. Uh, hi, doc Dr. LaGuardia. I am that nervous freshman right at the moment. You are, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> In his major American writers class with all of the upper class. One of my pure Zoom students. <laughs> and I am so glad I got you your last semester. Um, I'm really thankful for taking your class, even if it is over Zoom and worst circumstances that it could be um you know I am nervous freshman so I don't speak up in class very much but one thing that you always do you stay after class for those people that don't speak up during class and we always have great conversations and it's my favorite moments you know and I talk about you to my other professors that always ask like you know can we have a guest speaker like who do you guys do you guys know anyone that <laughs> you can bring in I'm like oh there's this one professor that I have oh I like him so much he's so cool and um you know your your class is just you know helps me to think deeper and it helps me to you know I'm I'm an English major now and yay solidified my <laughs> my um decision in that so thank you Megan it's great it's great that you had the courage and the confidence to even chime in so thank you for doing that and and um I, you know you probably can speak in a way that others can't to what what zoom classes are all about you know because they 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 are quite a bit different and you're hearing perhaps from others that the in-class context is you know can be so rich uh and yet the zoom classes have their own different kind of richness so it's, it's, but it's hard to adjust to, it is. Oh, I, I missed the unmute button like four different times trying to unmute there. But <laughs> hi, Dr. Sure. LaGuardia. Um, <laughs> I, I wanna preface my comments with um, a, a little tale of, uh, I guess your reputation in the English department. Uh, being an English major, taking classes with other English majors, especially as an underclassman with like the older students, um, always hearing so much about the mythical Dr. LaGuardia, just like, oh, you need to take a class with LaGuardia. How have you not yet? And unfortunately, I had somehow avoided you up until last year. Um, but thankfully, I got one class in. Um, and truly, it was just, a, I guess, a mind blowing experience. I mean, I've always loved literature. Um, I've known I wanted to major in English since early in high school. Um, but one of the things that I love, I think, most about Carol, and especially your class, which I think is the peak of this example, is um, sometimes English classes feel less like a class and more on the topic of book clubs, like a book club. You know, you read, you come in, and you get to just see the literature through other people's eyes. And it's just, I, to me, your class was the peak of that experience at Carroll for me. So I'm, I'm just ever grateful to have had to even get one class with you. I think that's wow. Wow. incredible. Thank you for saying that, Dimitri. And I got your request for a letter of recommendation. And I'll be glad to write it. Thank you. I, I didn't want to ask. I wasn't going to be like, also, did you get my email? But I realized that I hadn't responded to you yet. So yeah, uh, that's fine. And God, now, now it has to be a good letter. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> no ulterior motives to my praise, I promise. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so you're, much for you're welcome. Thank you. Even the one great class. So thanks, Dimitri. Hi, Dr. LaGuardia. <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> it's my daughter. This is your daughter. In, in, in Bellingham, I, Washington. She usually is calling me at about say, this time. 
well, because I can't call you because you're doing this with a hundred or 200 or 300 other people. I just wanted to share that for 53 years, I have been a part of John Carroll and you inspired me to be an English major. And you inspired me to go to law school. <laughs> And I inspired you to put kerfluffle into your speech. <laughs> yes, and you did. this is the first lecture that I have seen. So I am one of your brand new students and I am going to be the champion of your book club. And I encourage all of these people out there to not silence the voice of Dr. LaGuardia. I love you. Oh, wow. I mean, he, he, what, what happens, you know, to professors is that their their children never see them do what they do, uh, and and uh, so remember I said sentimental idiot. Well, I passed it on. Uh, <laughs> so, so thank you, Lisa. What do you say? Should we uh, call it a night? It's been so rich and so lovely. Um, and I thank everybody who, who's continued to hang out with us. Um, know that uh, Dr. LaGuardia is not going away forever. He's within email contact and it sounds like we have a book club uh, getting started <laughs> up. So um, keep, please keep in touch. And um, thanks so much again, David, for offering us some words of wisdom tonight. You're very welcome, and thanks for having this idea. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. LaGuardia. <laughs>